Good evening all. How the devil are you? Hope you are all well. Thank you very much for coming over and joining me tonight. Um, I'm in the workshop on my own tonight. Due to the reason being is uh, because it's a, I thought it'd be a, a back to basics tool control that I really don't really need, really need Terry and Brian in the background. Um, so I thought that I'd do it on my own. Plus, Terry's over in Ireland seeing Brian, so I thought that'd give him a chance to get together and spend the evening rather than having to worry about tonight. But to be honest, I'm quite looking forward to uh, doing it on my own. It's quite nice sometimes just to be in the workshop, bit of peace and quiet, explain what needs to be explained to you guys. And if there's any questions, as always, stick questions in the chat. Please put a queue in front of the questions and then hopefully I will catch them. I have a monitor going over there, so hopefully I'll be able to catch the questions. They may be a little bit delayed because it's going through YouTube, um, but I will catch the questions. If not, just keep it in there and I will eventually catch it. I'll, you know, we'll do a bit, we'll stop, we'll do a bit, we'll stop and we'll see how it goes. So, hope everybody's well. Hope everybody's had a great week and it's Friday. So, let's get the weekend started. Um, as the title said, it's all about tool control. Um, I get loads of people message me about getting catches, can't get a good finish, this, this, and this. So I thought what we'd do is we'd go right back to basics and see if we can help some people who watch the channel or some people who are going to watch the video back later on and see if we can help them uh, improve their game and maybe get more tool control, less tear out, less catches, and give them a bit more confidence within their wood turning journey. So that's what tonight's all about. Whether we get a bowl completely finished, I'm not sure. But I really want to just go through the basics of um, the the presentation, the, the the way the gouge feeds, what the parts of the gouge are, this, that, and the other, just basically to help anybody who needs it. So let's get on with it. I'll just quickly read through the chat. Let's get rid of this thing here. Uh, just go to the top. So the first one was Shane Hurst and Gary Glass, Wurzel, Paul Finley, uh, Wayne Wood Turner, Rob from Kingspool. What's we got? Let's scroll through. Gerald the French Turner. Jennifer's Wood Creation. Oh, Jennifer Craft and Creation. Sorry, Jennifer. Hope you're well. Terry Bartlett. If I miss anybody, I apologize. Copper Owl Wood Turner. Hi, Rob. Philip Greenwood. Hi, Philip. I need to speak to you, Philip. Oh, you remind me, I need to message you, sir. I'll be messaging you. Um, let's have a look. Who else we got? Ch -ch -ch Colin Izzard. Lucy Bundy Rowe. Hi, Lucy. Andy Dawes 60. Oops. Just jumped, as it always does. Colin Izzard. Graham Brown. Hi, Graham. Mike Evans, hi Mike. Hi Colin, Wood Wizardry by Colin. Doug Miller, hi, how you doing? Fred Gilliver. Uh, is that it? I think that might be it. Des Barnwell, hi Des, how are you? Roy's the boy, hi Roy. Hope you're well. Uh, is that it? I think that Paul Hyten. I think that may be it. If I haven't um, called anybody, oh, GPNA. Good evening. New name to the chat. Thank you very much for coming over. I think I see someone else. Is it Avon? Did I see you there as well? So evening, everybody. So welcome over to the channel. Hope you all are well. If this is your first time to the channel, then I really do appreciate you guys coming over. And I hope you enjoy what you see. As always, if there's any questions, uh, please put a queue in front of your question and we will get to it as and where we can. So with that, I'm going to go over and make a start. Malcolm Douglas, hi. And oh, no, it's Andy. Hi as well. How are you both? Right. So. Let's go over to the lathe. I've got a blank on the lathe. It's only a piece of software. It's not nothing high tech. Um, obviously, it's a, this is just going to be to show basic. So we're not going to use um, nothing high. We're not going to use a hard piece. We're going to use a soft piece of wood just to do this. So my personal preference is before I start turning is nine times out of the 10, excuse me, I will use a 54 mil force and a bit to create my mortise in the back. That gives me a nice 
secure clamping point because I use the record power uh, SC4 and SC3 chucks and SC2. Um, so 54 mil is the perfect size for um, the SC2, 3 and 4 clamping, or 3 and 4, sorry, not 2. Um, so that's perfect. So that drills that on the, on the pedestal drill, gives me a nice secure fixing. So what I like to do then is I like to face off the front of my piece and get me a perfect round piece. So round it off, face it off. I don't like turning the shape when this is out of shape because you get a bit of bounce and I don't I don't like the feel of the t going through the tool and I just don't like the feel of it. So I'd rather spend a few minutes just facing the blank off, making it perfectly round and that gives me a data line to start from. So that's what we're going to do first off. We're going to make this flat. Actually, no, we're not. We're going to make it round to start with. Going to make sure it clears our tool rest. We're going to grab our weapon of choice, which for me is the... 3.8 bowl gouge. So I'm going to use that, put a sharp end in it. So we've got a nice sharp um, gouge. Always start with a nice sharp gouge. Makes life so much easier. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a tool rest just below center. And then we're going to take this off. Now, two different ways you can do this. You can either do a push cut or a pull cut. Your particular choice. Many people do different ways. I prefer a push cut. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to turn the lathe right down, start the lathe up, Let's gradually turn the lathe up to get our speed. And we're just going to present the tool to give us our push cut. Right, so what we need to do is, obviously presenting the tool, we need to make sure we've got a couple of things. First is we're going to do the ABC. Um, so we've got anchor bevel cut. So we're going to anchor our tool by laying our gouge on our tool rest. Then we're going to ride the bevel, which is this part here, and then we're going to create our cut. So what we're going to do is by create to create our cut, we're just going to gently lift our handle until we find the tool to start to cut, and then we can start presenting the tool to create our, our cut across our face. So anchor, tool on, tool rest, bevel, ride the bevel. And we're going to lift the handle just till we get a cut. You can see the shavings coming off of there now. So we're going to create our cut. We're going to do it again. So A, B, C, anchor, bevel, cut, and then feed the tool. Now all the movement going from side to side is all in the, in the body weight. It's moving your body weight from side to side. You're not pushing your arms across. You're moving your whole body across. So you're standing where you want the cut to finish. And you're going to be uncomfortable to start your cut. But when you finish, you should be comfortable. So again, anchor, bevel, cut. And you can see my whole body is rocking over. My whole body is rocking. I'm not moving my arms. They're locked into my body. And as I'm coming to the end, I'm slowly easing off just so it trickles past the edge. And that should give us a nice, even cut across there. Hi, Dr. Bob. Hi, Old Man River. How are you both? Hope you're well. Hi, Susie. So that's give us a nice round blank. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move, it's hot and sweaty in here, not everything's sticking to me. Just gonna move this round to create our cut on our front. Uh, lens handcrafts and science question. What angle do you typically have your go? My gouges are 45 45. Um, 45 degrees there, 45 degrees there. Typical finger fire, finger uh, grind, which is what I like. That's what most gouges come with, and that's what I like to keep them out. I get on well with it. I did try altering them, but I struggled, so I decided to put them back. Um, and then, um, I'll get on well with it, so why change? Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to face off the front of our piece. So we are going to go on to uh, this camera, uh, this one here. So what we're doing now, move it a bit closer. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to do some pull cuts. Just move that handle over there. So I'm going to do some pull cuts. So what I'm going to do is my tool rest wants to be on my center. So we're going to make sure we're on center, which we are. Handle low. And I'm going to be using, the only thing I'll be using is this wing here to create a shear, a slicing cut. 
if we have the handle high and have the but the gouge parallel with our piece we're actually creating a scrape we don't want that that's you might as well use carbides if you're going to do that we want to cut so what we want is we want the handle low and, and with this axe is the wood coming around and it's actually cutting the wood not if you're scraping it like that you're just going to end up with loads of dust come off it we actually want it to cut the wood as you can see us cutting nice shavings off so same principle as cutting the other way Just, I will do, Roy. I will do. Just give us a minute. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring the handle in. Again, anchor, bevel. We're going to ride the bevel. And then we're just going to roll the gouge in until we get a nice cut. And then we're just going to roll that gouge along. You can see it bounce at the moment because the blank's not true. But that is the idea of facing off our blank. So again, just bring it across the front. And all we're doing at the moment is just facing off this blank so it's nice and flat. Like I say, a lot of people don't do this, but I prefer to. I'd rather spend a couple of minutes getting it nice and smooth. And I find it's a much more enjoyable shape. You're shaping, and it's, you're not getting the tool bounce about quite as much. So I find it more enjoyable. So there we have, we have the bottom flattened off and we have the edge all turned. So we've got a nice flat, nice round, uh, blank that we can start creating our shape. So what I'm going to do for this uh, purposes of this live, I'm going to do a tenon on here. So we need to discuss or need to find out what size our tenon is, depending on what jaws you're using, um, depending on what jaws you're using, depending on what chuck you're using. The the, the tenon is going to have to be a different size for the SC4 and the SC3 chuck. You need a tenon size around between 52 and 55 millimeters. Um, no, a mortise, 52 to 55 millimeters. And the tenon needs to be anywhere between 45 and 47 millimeters. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to find my center, which is there somewhere. So we're going to do a tenon. So I need the 47 millimeters. So we're going to go. Uh, Around about there somewhere. So we're going to find our circle. And we'll just stop it and double check it. If you don't get your tenon right, then you won't be grabbing to the full capacity of your chuck. <laughs> so what we need to do is we need to create the perfect uh, tenon. So if you look at this, it just shows you the basics of a, a tenon. Um, you can see the green line. That is where the chuck jaw should grab the tenon, which is a perfect contact point around the whole circumference of the jaws. If the tenon is too big, then you're only going to pinch on the two corners of the jaws. Um, and if the tenon is too small, you're only going to grab on the center of the jaws. You're not going to grab on the whole capacity. You don't want your tenon too deep that it bottoms out on the bottom of the jaws, as you can see by the red line there. You need it so the top of the jaws should just nudge up against the shoulder of the tenon. So let's have a look at this one. So as you can see there, mortise and tenon, ideal size, 100% contact between the jaws and the tenon, 100% contact between the mortise and the jaws as well, which will give you the maximum capacity for holding. Ouch, that was a static shot through my stream deck for some reason. So let's just go back and I'll show you on this camera here. So if your tenon is too big, you'll only be pinching on this point here and this point here because the jaws will be open too far. If the tenon is too small, you'll only be clamping on this point here on each jaw. So you're only going to get a quarter of your clamping capacity. The ideal size is to get it so you get as much as that jaw in contact with your tenon or your mortise as possible. That's the idea of getting the correct size. Getting that correct, you get a lot of people say, oh, it, it jumped out on me, blah, 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 blah. A lot of it is because they haven't created the tenon or their mortise correctly. So spend a little bit of time, get that right. So what I like to do is I like to come just outside my line 
and then gradually just keep honing it back until I get the perfect size. So that's what we're going to do. So again, we're going to do some pull cuts. Sit. So same principle as flattening off. So we're going to bring a gouge in. I'm going to start just in front of my line and I'm going to start taking that away. Now you can create your tenon first or you can shape your bowl first. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to start taking some of this around because that's the way I want it. And then I can start bringing in for my tenon. Tenon needs to be anywhere between two and five millimeters in diameter, or I mean in depth, sorry, depending on how comfortable you feel. So we're going to go there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring in a spindle gouge. And I'm just going to gradually bring that into there to give me a nice, I want a nice tight um, point on the transaction between the bottom of the bowl and the the tenon on the bottom. Don't know if you can really see it on that camera, can you? No, maybe not. Uh, let's try a different camera. Let's try this one. So what I'm looking for is a nice tight transaction line in there. So. And I'm putting a slight dovetail on this, hence why I'm using a spindle gouge. Just give that little tiny dovetail on there. So we're going to stop that. We're going to check it, check our size. That is 48 millimeters. So I'm just going to take a little bit more. Actually, what I'm going to do, if you've got a spare, if you've got a spare chuck, you can always use a spare chuck just to try it. So we're just going to nip that up. I'll bring it on overhead. So you can see we've got a gap there. Now that gap is three millimeters, which is around about what we want. Anywhere between four and two and four millimeters is perfect. So we've got a nice equal gap in there. We've got a nice little dovetail on there where our, uh, our jaws are going to grab as you, because on the record power, not all jaws are the same. On the record power, you've got a little tiny lip sitting in there. So if you wanted to, to be a little bit more secure, you can just put a little tiny rebate line in the back there just to give you a little bit more security. But I think with a piece of softwood, you're fine because as you nip it up, it will grab into the wood. So our tenon's the right size. We know we've got that right. So what we can do now is just take off those. Well, we're not really going to worry about those furry bits. We can clean those up when we just give it a quick sand. But we don't want to touch that anymore. That's that's it. We don't want to mess around with that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start getting our shape. So we're going to do the same principle as we did we're flattening off the bottom of the bowl. We're going to start shaping it around with some pull cuts. And then we're going to gradually shape the shape, whatever you desire to to um, uh, to shape the bowl, you whatever you want. Uh, there's many different shapes, but I like a nice gradual curve, which is what I'm going to go for. So I'm going to do, you can do pull and push cuts. I'm going to do a few of both, depending on which way the grain is going, depending on what you do on your final cut. Um, because if you go one way, you could get a lot of tear out going the other way, could get rid of it. So it just depends on the wood at the time. So again, we're going to go anchor, always ABC, anchor, drop that handle so we get that cut in action. And then we're just going to gradually remove this corner with some pull cuts. And we're gradually going to bring in our shape. And again, it's just moving the tool rest to bring you as you're coming around the bowl. Try and keep as little of as little of the tool hanging over the tool rest as possible. Uh, the more handle and tool behind the tool rest you have, the more security you'll get. So try and keep the tool rest as close to the piece as you can get it. So we're just going to gradually shape that round. So we're just going to stop our lathe and check it. So it's actually cutting quite nice. 
So we're just going to bring our tool rest around a little bit. Just give us that security that we were just talking about. We're just going to carry on bringing that and pull cuts around there. Now, if you wanted to, from this stage, you could do some push cuts, but I do like the pull cuts. But like I said earlier, if I had a lot of tear out doing this, I would then do a couple of push cuts the other way to see if I could get rid of that. But that would perhaps be my last few cuts. I'd do most of it with the pull cuts and then just finish it off with a couple of push cuts. But that is actually cutting really nice. And we're not getting hardly any tear out at all on there. So let's just bring you, oh, you're on overhead. So let's just move that out a little bit so you can see a little bit better. Let's just uh, do picture in picture so we can have that one. Let's see that a little bit better. So as I'm doing, I see anchor or anchor bevel, and then I'm just gently bringing in that cut, not pushing on it. Just gently thought this hand's not really doing nothing. All this hand's doing really is just laying on the gouge. It's not going to, if I take it off, it's not going to cause any issues. It's just, it's more security to have it there. So we've got some nice shape coming there now. So I'm just going to move my tool rest around for a final piece. Uh, Mike Gavin, Steve, can you explain the position of the flute on your cuts? Yes, I can, Mike. So what I'm doing on a pull cut, my flute is around about 11 o'clock. So I'm coming in there and I'm using this wing as a slice. If I close my flute up to nine o'clock, that's a scraping action. I don't want scraping, I want cutting. So I'm opening my flute to about 11 o'clock. And as I'm presenting the tool, I'm just gently riding the bevel and then I'm gently closing the flute until I get the desired cut that I require. Because sometimes you want a deep cut, sometimes you want a soft cut. And then as soon as I've got the desired cut I want, I'm holding that position and I'm just gently rocking my body back on my two feet. So if I come on to this camera here, I've set this camera up here. So you'll be able to see me rock. So what I'm doing is once I'm in my position, I'm in where I'm going to finish my cut. So what I'm doing is I'm just rocking my body around. I'm not, the tool is staying on my hip. So I'm bringing the tool in. I'm just gently closing the flute till I get the cut I want. And then I'm just gently rocking my body around. And I'm not actually moving the tool. It's my body that's moving. And it's all rocking from my, I'm rocking from my right leg over to my left leg. I know it's uncomfortable when you start, but eventually you do get used to it and you're just rocking back and rocking on that on the leg. So going back to the tool settings or the tool, I'm right, I'm, over, I'm, I'm presenting the tool to the piece of wood. So I'm right, so I'm anchoring it. I'm riding this bevel on the wood, like so, as you can see, and I'm just gently closing my flute until I get the desired cut I want. And then I'm bringing my tool round to give me my, my cut. And again, I'm not moving the tool. Well, I am moving the tool, but it's all my body movement. It's not moving it with the hands and arms. It's all your body movement, as you can see like that. So we've got a nice shape coming up there. Got a little bit of tear out there. So we might try a push cut just to get rid of that. But I've got a little bit of a, a bulge in here I want to get rid of. So we're just going to get rid of that. So again, it's just light cuts. I mean, don't get me wrong, sometimes when you're doing something big, you want to remove the material quick. So you will hog out the material, but enjoy the moment. Don't, you know, you don't have to rush through it. Enjoy the moment. So let's have a look at the shape. So we've got a nice shape, nice continuous shape. We've got a little bit of tear out here. So we will just do one push cut around and see if we can get that tear out. So we need to move our tool rest. So we've got a happy medium, so we can do the cut in a continuous flow. So I'm gonna drop down to a 10 mil bottle gouge. Um, exactly the same principle, ABC, but this time we're gonna feed it. So we're riding on 
the, the bevel and we're using this point here to create our cut. Before we was using this wing here, now we're gonna go to this point here. So if we go back and look at the, um, the shape of a bowl gouge, obviously you'll hear about riding the bevel, riding the bevel. That's this piece here, as you can see by the diagram. Um, then you've got the cutting edge, which is the bit I just explained to you. The wings, which are obviously what we use for pull cuts, which are the slice in action. And then you've got the flute, which is there designed to reject the, 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 uh, the waste material. And you hear about people rubbing the heel. Now the heel is the bottom edge of the, of the gouge. Um, this is the heel here. Now this comes into play a lot when you're turning the inside of a bowl, not really when you're doing the outside more than when you're doing the inside. So, um, this, uh, we'll talk about more of that when we do the inside of the bowl, but on this, on doing the outside, we're just gonna gently feed it around, a nice gentle feed, just gently rubbing that bevel all the way around to give us a continuous cut all the way around. So let's go onto a camera that you'll be able to see. You won't be able to see with that one, that's for sure. Uh, picture in picture. Uh, back and over, let's have a look at that one. That'd be better. Right, so I'm going to start here and I'm going to gently ride it around to give me a cut. Hopefully that's going to get rid of a lot of this tear out in here. So we're going to start a lathe. We're going to pick up our cut like so. And we're just gently going to ride that bevel. Not like that, we're not. Just gently ride that bevel all the way around that bowl. Nice gentle cut. And again, I'm moving my body. I'm not moving the tool. I'm rocking my body from my left foot to my right foot. To give me that continuous cut. Like that. So we'll just look at that, see if that's got rid of that tear out. And that's got rid of a lot of that tear. It's still got a little tiny bit there because we're actually pushing the, the straws that way, which is like tearing out. Let's try going the other way. If we do a push cut the other way, that may get rid of that because we'll be pushing the straws into themselves or the, 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 the grain into itself. Therefore, it may not tear out so much. So let's try the other way. So we're going to do exactly the same principle, but we're running on this side of the, of the tool now, not this side. So we're going to do exactly the same. We're just going to gently pick it up. And that's actually much, much better. That's got rid of a lot of that. Um, um, got rid of all that tear out because we've actually, what we've done now is the, the, the grain is coming this way. So going that way, we're tearing it out. Going that way, we're actually pushing it back into the bowl and it's got rid of all that tear out. So that's absolutely excellent. Right, so quickly get that sanded up. I'm going to start off at 120 because it's good enough to do that. And then we'll sand that just quickly up to 240. I will go through the ceiling part just quickly, uh, but we're not going to spend too much time on it because it's not really about that. So let's just quickly sand this up. So I'm using the Simon Hope inertia sander here, which is my preferred sander. So we're going to get as close as we can to that tenon. Just going to check it. I'm not going to worry about here too much because we're going to be taking that tenon off there. So that's not a problem. So we'll go up now to 180, then 240. With these inertia sanders, you don't need loads of pressure. We don't need any pressure really. You're letting the friction between the sandpaper and the piece do all the work. And you're only using the the third, a third of the of the pad. You're not using no more than that. You don't need to use no more than that. Um, if you use 
try and go over that, it won't rotate properly. So if you just use that that third area, then that'll work absolutely perfect. So final one, 240, let's get a new pad on there. That's it, it's up to 240. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna seal that. So some sand and sealer. So we're just going to seal this up and get a polish on it and then we'll get on to the inside which i think is where most people have the issues actually not the outside So coat of sand and sealer, and then we're going to denib that with a bit of uh, Abronet, not Abronet, Scotch Bright, just to knock back the fibers. So we're then going to give it a second coat of sand and sealer. Second coat. So we'll give that a buff off with Yorkshire grit. All right, so Yorkshire grit and abrasive paste, we're gonna apply it on first. Give her an equal covering. Turn the lathe on about 500 RPM. And we're just gonna gently apply this, working it all in. You guys should know how this works now. Hi Pete, how you doing bud? Hope you're feeling a bit better. We're just going to speed up a little bit. Hi, Todd, how you doing? So find a little bit, just speed it up. So what we're gonna do now is get a clean bit of tissue and we'll buff that off. So all we're doing now is just removing the excess beeswax. A bit 
more. So that's the Yorkshire grit done. So what we're going to do is just apply our finish over it, which in this case will be Hampshire's Sheen's microcrystalline wax. I'm going to put microcrystalline over it because uh, if it's handled, it won't. It's got a harder wear on it. You don't get fingerprints on like you do the, uh, the high gloss. So we're going to put a couple of coats of this on. You won't get a nice shine on it like you do the the uh, high gloss, but it's a bit more durable. So clean piece of cloth. So I'm just going to buff this off. Again, if nobody's done, if not everybody's done the Hampshire Sheen Finishing Academy, then you really need to go and do it to learn how to use the Hampshire Sheen products. If you use them, that is. <coughs> Excuse me. So just going to give that another coat. Just to finish that off. So that's our nicely finished base of our bowl. That should be finished to around about a thousand grit, which uh, is a nice finish for a bowl. So what we've got to do now is do the inside. So let's get this flipped. And we know our tenon fits because it fitted the other jaws, which are exactly the same jaws. So we're going to open that up a little bit. And we've got that nice three millimeter gap in there. So we know we've got that perfect clamping capacity, which is give us the maximum capacity clamping of them jaws. So first thing I'm gonna do is face off my piece. Same as before, because as you can see, it's not, uh, if we go overhead, as you can see, it's not really perfectly flat. So we're gonna go overhead, um, we're gonna go ahead and, um, Flatten that off. So we're going to bring our three eight bowl gouge back, and exactly the same principle as we did the back. We're going to do some little shear cuts. So anchor on our tool rest, present the tool to give you our cut, and then just gently bring the tool across to flatten out the front of our bowl. So I'm just going to get that flat. Seems to be grabbing there for some reason. Bit of wax or something on the on the gouge, maybe. Sometimes uh, always handy to just clean your tool rest. Just give it a bit of a rub up, just to get rid of any. Uh, waxes or solvents so we're just going to try that again oh, that's much better much better all right so we've got a nice flat surface now that we can work with so i'm going to just bring my tool back tool rest back a little tiny bit so we've got a camera that you guys can see so now we're hollering out the center. We're using the tool a different way. We're using it as push cuts. Um, we've done a lot of pull cuts so far, but now we're going to do some push cuts. So we're actually going to be using this part of the tool again, same as we did when we did the push cut on the back, but we're going to be using this part of the, the gouge here. 
So we're going to gently create some feeds into it. Um, now, a couple of things you want to think about when you're um, doing a push cut on the inside of a bowl on how hard you're rubbing the, the bevel. If you're rubbing it too hard, you can see by um, two things can happen. You're either going to get some jumps and catches, or you're going to end up with imperfection, an imperfect line on the inside. And the same is if you're not rubbing the bevel hard enough or you're off the bevel, you're going to get the same issue. So the idea is just gently, gently rubbing that bevel as you're going in to feed the gouge around. If you're pushing too hard, you're going to feel it jumping and jerking. If you're not hard enough, then the same sort of principle. So you need to be a happy medium. You need to try and adjust your feed rate to the speed of the machine. If the machine is spinning at 2000 RPM, obviously you can feed a bit quicker. If you're sp turn the bowl out at say six to eight hundred which is more which is what i normally do um you need to slow your feed rate down a little bit so you need to correspond the feed rate with your tool speed um if you ride the bevel correctly you'll end up with a nice smooth even cut um on the inside so while you're removing um while you're removing the waste material inside it doesn't really matter if the cut is not perfect it's when you come to that final cut that you want the final cut to be nice and perfect. So what we're going to do is the ABC exactly the same. So anchor, bevel, you can see that's beveling on there. They're riding on the bevel. We're not got any cut. As soon as we start lifting our handle up, you can see the shavings coming off. We're now getting a cut. So it's anchor, bevel, cut, and then you're just gently going to feed it in. Same again. So you'll perhaps see a couple of different people turn out bowls different ways. Um, some people will start from the middle and back feed out like so. Some people will do this way. I do either or. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, but it's whatever you're comfortable at. So we're just gently going to feed in. And remember, as you come to that middle, that middle is turning at half the speed as the outside. So you really need to slow that feed rate down. If you go in too quick and you're trying to push it through, as you're coming through the middle there and you're still pushing, if you're pushing, you will break that bit out of the middle there. So as you're coming through into the middle, you need to ease off the pressure, open the flute a little bit and let that nib just fall in the center of your gouge. So as we're coming in, find the bevel, get the cut and then gently feed in to create your nice equal cut and again you're you're adjusting your feed rate to the speed of your bowl so obviously the center is now getting slower so what we need to do is we need to slow down our feed rate so as we're coming through the mid to the middle we're going to lift our handle a little bit and then we're gently going to open the flute oops open the flute a little bit just so that nib jumps off. Tool rest is a little bit high, really. Let's just move that down a little tiny bit. So it's a little bit exaggerated, but as you go in, in you're sort of doing that motion. Obviously, it's not as much as that, but it is what you're doing. So you're going in, you're going up, and as you're coming down, you're coming down towards the center, you're opening the flute up just for that little nib to pop out in the middle there. So we'll do another cut. So nice and feed. So as you can see, we're just gently gliding that bevel over our piece to give us a nice even cut. We're allowing the gouge to feed itself really. All we're doing is guiding it. And as you see, we're coming to the middle. We're coming to the middle. And we're just gonna slow our feed down, lift our handle a little bit, open up the flute a little bit. And just let that nib fall out into the middle of our bowl, into the middle of our gouge. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to sharpen this gouge up a little bit. Actually, I'll sharpen this one I've got here. So it's always nice and nice to have a nice sharp gouge. You'll notice, you automatically notice the difference once you've got a sharp gouge. So I'll just quickly sharpen both ends of this up. 
and then we'll just quickly come back and finish that off. I always use a sharp gouge for my final cut. So the last cut is the most important. Hoping that we can get the best finish off the tools we can get. So we've got a nice sharp tool now. Just change tools. If you've got a real small bowl, you can always use a 10 mil, um, 10 mil gauge just to finish it off. Again, depends on how wide you want the rim or how thick you want it. I mean, to me, that is quite acceptable. It's quite, it's a nice dish out in the middle. Obviously, we'd finish it off better than that, but it's a nice dish out in the middle. If you want to put some texture around the outside here or whatever you want to do, but we're going to turn this, uh, turn a bit more out than that. Now, the depth is not far from what we want. We actually need, um, uh, we need to just get a bit more width out of it. So wherever you point the bevel is where the gouge is going to go. So if you point the bevel like that, the gouge is going to go across like that. So we want to go in and follow the shape of our bowl. So what we need to do is to bring our gouge right over to start going down and then feathering round. Now, yes, okay, they always say keep the handle tight to your hip, but you physically can't do that. If you're going to move, you could swing the head around and do it that way but it's quite safe as long as you know what you're doing to do it this way. So we're going to anchor it. We're going to get our cut. Once we got to cut, we're then going to lift the handle a little tiny bit and we're going to feed our gouge in. And then we're going to start to gently bring the handle towards me to carry on that cut, to bring it into our already depth that we've already got. So as you can see our snare coming round. So remember, wherever you point that bevel is where it's going to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to ride that bevel along the bottom of our bowl and that will flatten out the bottom of our bowl. If you get a hump in the middle of your bowl, if you get a hump in the middle of your bowl, what you're doing is you're coming in, you're bringing the handle too far around and you're riding the heel, which is causing the centre of the bowl to come up. What you need to do is close the, the gouge or bring the the base of the gout, the hand of the gouge around. So you're actually closing that gap up and then that'll keep you a, a nice flat edge on your bottom. So let's just do that again. So again, I'm bringing that gouge, that's a bit too much deep. So I'm just gonna remove some of this waste on the outside. Now you see that jumping there, because I'm trying to force it round. We're just going to bring that there, we'll do another one. Again, you watch the handle come round. I don't know if you can see the handle, can you? No, you can't see the handle. Let's uh, go on a different camera. Hopefully you can see the handle then. Uh, that one, see if you can go on that one. Right, so you see the handle now. Oh, no, my arm's in the way. Zoom that out a bit. No, wrong way. That way. Right, so handle watch the handle so i'm bringing the gouge in and as i'm coming around i'm bringing the handle around right so so now now i'm getting to the correct thickness down there. So I need to remove some of this now. So we're not gonna be so aggressive on the curve. So exactly the same though. Just check that. So we've got a fairly consistent um, thickness. So what I'm going to do now, it's just a little bit thicker from there. So I'm just going to clean this up because I've got a little bit of chattering on there because that's a bit too thin. So I've got a little bit of chattering on here. 
So we're going to try again with this. If not, we'll go to a smaller gouge, or it might be better with a bigger gouge, actually. But we can do a light pass now. So if we do a light pass, then um, hopefully that will... Um, yeah, thumbs. I, I understand what you mean now. So just a light cut. So from about there is where it gets a little bit thick. So we'll just take a little bit more out of there. We're just going to finish the bottom off. Again, lift the handle, close the, open the flute, pop that little bit out of the middle. So I think we've got a few chatter lines around the outside here. This is where it's flexing. But other than that, it's not too bad. It's fairly consistent. We don't want to go too thin because obviously we've got to remove our tenon at the moment. So we don't want to go too thin in the bottom there. But we could. Mm, no, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to take no more out of that. I could lose a bit if I, I could go through the bottom if not. So, uh, right. So that's the inside turned. As you can see, we've got a few... There's a few little chatter lines on here. Um, that's because it's gone so thin. <coughs> Excuse me. That's because it's gone so thin. Um, if you go thin, if you leave the centre core in, that will keep a little bit of... Oh, I've got to get a drink. <coughs> bit of dust. Right, let's try again. If you're going to go thin, leave the centre core in. It gives it a little bit more stability. So when you're coming out, so you turn down 15, 20 mil, then take the core out, then turn down another 15, 20. But once you've done that, don't go back and redo it. Once you've cut it and you've finished cutting it, leave it at that. So anyway, all right, let's get that quickly sanded up. Now you can do this with the inertia sander again, but I'm going to do it with a, a drill because that's my preferred method. So we're going to turn the lathe on, turn the extraction on. If you're sanding the inside of a bowl with a drill, you want to be sanding away from you. If you come this side, it's going to try and snatch. So if you go away from you, you're actually sanding into the bowl with this way. It's trying to snatch around that way all the time. If you want a nice sharp corner here, don't take the edge of the sanding pad any only up to the corner. Don't go over the corner because as soon as you go over the corner, it will start to round. So if you want a nice sharp corner, finish the pad just at that corner. Just got a little bit of a hump there. That's better, much better. So we just sand this outer edge. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do a little bit on this edge here because I don't want to, that's a sharp edge and I don't want to leave that. Oops. That could be quite dangerous. So now we'll go up the grits. Again, we'll go up to 240.
that's up to 240. I think you could be right there, Pete. I did wash it about a month ago, but it's not worth I think I got an air leak somewhere, to be honest. I think I got an air leak somewhere. I think that's the problem. Right. Cameras are too sensitive. That's what it is. You can see all the dust. I need to turn the quality of the cameras down. <laughs> Andy, how can you say things like that? That's not very nice. I actually, um, I do like doing lives on my own every now and again. It's nice because it's, uh, you seem to get a bit more information across and also it's uh, a bit more peaceful. But um, I don't mind. Um, I don't mind having earworms in, but sometimes it can get a little bit chaotic. Right, so let's get, oops, let's get this sand and sealed. Hmm, I'll keep hold of it, that helps. We're going to give us a couple of coats of sand and see there. So the same principle as what we did on the um, the outside. I think, not sure, I think it's a piece of ash. I'm not 100% sure. I got it from my local wood turning club and there wasn't anything on it. So uh, there, was a, there was a plank of it and I just brought it home for um, just things like this really, just for practicing on and uh, demonstrations. So, uh, so I'm not sure what it is. I think it, I'm not sure if it's ash or what, but I, it's uh, it's very soft. Let's put it that way. So second coat. But it comes up with a nice finish. That's for sure. See you later, Rob. Thanks for coming over, mate. Right, so we're going to get some Yorkshire grit on that one. Check out the way. Do, 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 do. Walnut. No, I don't get walnut, Ben. This is a. Um, no, I'm not going to say that. All right, so Yorkshire grit on first. Then we're going to turn it up to about 500 RPM. Work it in. Mm, might be, Phil, might be tulip. Might be, it's definitely soft. And I know tulip's quite a soft wood, isn't it? But like I say, there was no name on when I bought it. The plank was about four and a half foot long by just over the width of what this blank is. And I just bought it, um, like I say, from the club because all the money goes to the club. So I thought that'd be perfect for practicing on. 
it takes color really well. So yeah, it could be tulip. Yeah, that's, I like low cost wood. All right, so we're gonna speed up a little bit. So remember, yeah, Yorkshire grit's not a finish. It's just an abrasive paste. But this will take us up to about a thousand grit. Ready for our desired finish. So we're just going to get a clean bit of tissue. Just, uh, all right, Glenn, how you devil are you? You must have heard the word Yorkshire grit. So I'm just going to polish this off. All right, so that's all the wax off from the Yorkshire grit. So now we'll put our finish over it. Let's go with the high gloss wax this time. <laughs> so let's go with the high gloss wax and you'll be able to see the difference between the high gloss and the micro crystalline. I do like the high gloss. So nice even coat, making sure you work it really well in. Once you feel your tissue start to grab, you know the solvents have evaporated, evaporated, so you know it's ready to be polished off. So we're just going to buff this off. You can see the shine instantly come on there. Again, you don't need to apply any pressure, you're just letting the friction between the tissue and the, the finished piece do all the work. If you push too hard, you're just going to end up causing heat and then burning, burnishing off the wax that you've just applied. So we'll put a second coat on. Clean bit of tissue. So what I'm going to do now is just get a piece of safety cloth just to buff that up.
So that's the leave that out. Put that back in the drawer. All right. Same scraping. So what we've got to do now is just remove the tenon off the back. And then we are ready for our finished piece. As you can see, that Hampshire Sheen high gloss gives a lovely, um, lovely finish. Evening, Brian, how are you? Uh, a lovely finish on the on the Hampshire Sheen high gloss. Really, oops, excuse me, really, really nice. So let's get that out. It will change the jaws for some cold jaws. Guarantee the cold jaws will be the wrong size, so uh, we know we probably have to change them. So we'll put that over there out of the way, get the cold jaws off the wall. They're definitely in the wrong place. Definitely in the wrong place. Right, so let's get them changed. Uh, Allen key, which is that one, I believe. Yep. Uh, right, do you ever stick wood to go make deeper bowls? Yes, I do. Things like that, you mean? Is that what you mean? Something like that? Oh, you can't see it, can you? Let's go back on this one. Something like this one. That one. I have made, I have glued other pieces, you know, just blocks of wood together as well to make uh, deeper bowls as well. So, yes, I, I have done, uh, especially different species as well. So, um, right, let's have a look at this, see where we're going with this. I did stamp these, so I put some stamp marks on there to give me some rough guides for bowl sizes. So, we we'll measure the width of the bowl. 180 mil. So I think it really wants to be what we got. One, two, well, actually, four. One, two, three, four. I think it needs to be there in that one there. So let's put it in that one. And we'll see if it works. One eighty. Just talk amongst yourselves while I. <laughs> no, I've never done that one, Pete. But I have put them on. And then marked them wrong and put them in the wrong hole, one mil, one hole high, too high, or one mil, one hole too low, and then had to change them all. So I have done that though. Like that one, that's in the wrong one. What come one up? I mean, I like cold jaws, but they're just a pain in the backside. But I think whether they're cold jaws or um, I can't never remember the name of the other device that people use. Um, I think they're both as bad as each other, to be honest.
I have got a disc. I did make a disc with a soft mat. But to be honest, I got put off it the other day. I had a nice um, cherry bowl that I had a tenant on for a long time. And Chloe, my oldest daughter, wanted a fruit bowl. So I said, oh, yeah, I'll just all i got to do is turn the tenant off of it and I'll do it for you. So um, I made this platform, put the matting on it, let the matting dry. I came in here, put it on the machine, turned it off. I got carried away with the tenon. The tenon snapped. What was left of the tenon, the stub snapped, threw the bowl across the workshop, and now I've got a, a bowl that with no tenon on it that has um, got chunks out of the side. It's now got massive gouges out of the side of it, where I've now got to find a way of refinishing it. But the bottom turned out lovely. <laughs> anyway, you learn by mistakes. Right, let's get the bottom of this turned off. I think it was my own fault, though, because I used this live center. And I think this is too big and chunky. It needs to be something with a smaller a live center on it, a smaller stub on it. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't put so much pressure on it. But anyway. Let's get this in. Hopefully I'll go big enough to get it in. Yep. So I'm just going to nip that. Like that. Tear all these bits off so it don't flap about. All right, so a little spindle gouge. Just bring it up a little bit, a little bit higher than that. So what I'm going to do is just nibble away at this with a spindle gouge. And I'm just going to keep feeding it in, feeding it in. You want to try and keep the constant pressure pushing onto the piece rather than doing that because that can cause it to pop out. So if you just put the pressure on and then maybe just a gentle little push cut at the end just to flatten it all out. But turn it down low. These don't want to go no higher than 650 RPM. It's not quite central, that, but. It's not very central, is it? I'll just double check that. That's moved a little bit. Oh well, it is what it is. Just, just be the thickness of that paper on something. Let's take that bit of paper out, see if it makes any difference. No, exactly the same. That'll be all right. Right, so let's get this moved. So gentle movements to just remove that tenon. Just mind your hands, obviously, of the buttons as you're coming in. Uh, question, can you not glue a block on the bottom of that, Steve? Uh, what the, the, the chest, the, um, the cherry one? I could, but I might actually texture the outside. 
might do some carving on it just to make it look a little bit different on the outside. Don't matter what it looks like, it's going in Chloe's house. I won't see it. <laughs> so again, remember when you come to that middle bit, it's going half the speed as the rest of it. So nice and slow. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a gentle push cut on there. All right, so we'll just gently sand that up. So just get some sandpaper. Actually, I'll just quickly do this in the drill, I think. I think the problem is my extraction is just a little bit too high. Needs to come down just a little tiny bit, I think, as well. A little bit of sand and sealer. So all we need to do, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, 
Yorkshire grit that, but what we'll do is just denib it. And then we'll just put a little bit of Hampshire Sheen High Gloss on it. Oh, actually, we did, oh, too late now. <laughs> I did that with uh, Michael Crystalline, didn't I? But never mind. Your two tone bottom. And then we'll just polish that off. So that is our finished bowl. Wipe the edges, get rid of the sawdust. Blow the cold drawers off. Put them back as clean as we can. Put them back on the wall out of the way. Right, so, let's turn that off, get rid of that, get rid of that. I think that definitely needs to go lower. But anyway, right, so there is our finished bowl. So, nothing high-tech, nothing flash, but it's all about the way you present your toy, a toy, the way you present your tool, the way you use your tool to create that um, perfect cut. Um, we sanded that from 120 up to 240, and then we used Yorkshire grit. Could have done with a little bit more sanding, actually, because uh, you can still see a few uh, swirl marks in there from the lower grit. It um, is what it is. It's quite a soft bit of wood as well, so it would have um, it would have marked quite easily. But, yeah, there you go. Something easy, something basic. Let's come back on this camera, turn them off. This one here. So there we go, just a simple bowl. It's all about tool control. It's all about tool control. The more hours you get on the tools, uh, the better you will get. Like Pete said in the chat, treat every cut on the inside and outside as your finishing cut, and then eventually it'll come naturally uh, to get practice. I always tried to use my last cut with a nice sharp gouge to give me the best um, finish that I can get off the tool. If I can sand from 120 off the tool, then that is happy days. So there we go. So anyway, hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, sorry if it's been a bit dull and boring, but I just wanted to try, you know, people ask me loads of questions about um, the getting catches, the getting bits dragged out of the machine and this, that and the other. So I thought that, uh, it would be helpful to, just do this just to help a few people. So if it helps, then um, I'm really pleased. If it helps you or anybody else, then, you know, let me know. And if um, I can help anybody, I will. That's what it's all about. I just try to give back some of what I've already been given. Um, I've been quite lucky to have people support me through my, learn my turning journey. And uh, if I can return some of that to other people, then absolutely awesome. It makes it worthwhile. So, other than that, guys, thank you very much for coming over and joining me. Um, Wayne, the wood turner, if you're still in the live, um, then feel free to put your link in for tomorrow night. If not, make sure you go check out Wayne tomorrow night. Uh, I'm sure it'll be entertaining, as always. 
I will be back Sunday lunchtime live. I'm not doing no turn on Sunday. All I'm doing is casting with some resin. I want to make some blanks uh, for future projects. And I thought that'd be an op ideal opportunity to show you guys how I cast some of my blanks. Uh, you're always asking questions about when I cast, when I turn a blank, how was it cast? What wood was it? Did you put in a pressure pot? Didn't you put in a pressure pot? How did you mix your resin? Blah, blah, blah. So I thought rather than keep discussing it, I'll actually show you how to do it. So it's going to be uh, cast in blank or resin casting for beginners. So there'll be some real basic stuff in there. And then hopefully that will intrigue a few of you to actually have a go at doing it. So um, that's the plan there as well. So hopefully um, I'll see you there. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, I really appreciate your support as always. And uh, yeah, I'll see you on the next one. So anyway, guys, thanks for coming over. Take care. Speak to you soon. And I'll see you on Sunday. Have a great weekend. Bye for now. Bye. That's all, folks.